like you just don't belong? You ever felt like, um, like when you were in elementary school and they chose teams and you were always the last one chosen? And it's just like, um, wow, they like everybody else but me. Or maybe when you were in uh, high school, kind of like me, and, and all of the cool kids had parties and you never got invited. It's like, uh, I don't think I ever went to any party in high school. Unless it was one of my friends from church's you know, birthday party, if they were having it. Or maybe, maybe you um, recently, you, you're maybe single or, and you've been praying to God and, and all of a sudden it's just like, okay, God, I, is there something wrong with me? And you start looking at people and, and you think, oh, why is that person looking at me that way? Is it that they don't think that I'm attractive or, or whatever? And you feel like I just become an outcast. I'm just not fitting in. Or maybe, maybe it's when you come to church. Maybe you feel like, well, you know, I can't sing like them. Or, uh, I can't, I'm not dressed the right way. And I just don't feel like I fit in too well. I enjoy being here, but it's just, I just feel kind of odd and strange. Or maybe it's sometimes you feel like I just don't measure up. There's standards that everybody wants to sit for me and I just, I can't meet them. That's beyond expectations. They're too high for me. And I, I don't know what to do. I just continue to plug on where you feel like you're not valued, you're not accepted, and that, and that becomes a, a hazard. But let me take this a little bit farther. And let's talk about how you and I treat people that we think are outcasts. Um, and sometimes you'll say, well, I really don't think that I do that. I, I think that I'm really acceptive of about anybody. That I don't think I treat anybody any different than what I treat all, everybody else. But yet, they could look different than you. They could act different than you. Uh -oh. Or maybe it, it's just I'm not sure. Anybody come to mind? That maybe this week? Because over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about a movie that's coming out in October the 21st. It's a movie called I Am Not Ashamed. And it's based on a true story of a young girl by the name of Rachel Joy Scott. She was the first person killed at Columbine by the two men or the two young boys that were coming in 
to the school. She wasn't even in the school. She was outside. And what you'll, what you'll see is that she was considered an outcast. But one of the things that you need to understand about her is that she was remembered for her compassion and her kindness. And really, particularly for those people who felt like outcasts where she was at. The movie's going to show you how she befriended a disabled boy that nobody else would have anything to do with. A girl who was unpopular and another boy by the name of Nathan. Nathan was a youth that was living on the streets. And so we've got a, about a one minute clip of the first time that she had met Nathan and she brought Nathan to her youth group. So just watch this for a minute. I know it's your first time, but if you want to share about how your week has been. Yes, it is. No, I don't. It's OK. Um, well, my week kind of sucked. It's one well, of my dad's in jail. And uh, my mom, she, uh, she's, a, she's a heroin addict, so she's, she's not even eating anymore. You know, it's like she's staying in this house full of junkies. So I've been living in an alley near here the past couple weeks. And uh, it's just really hard to get a job, you know, without an address. Are you okay? Where are you going? What was I supposed to say? It's exactly what you should have said. No, I'm not like them, and I'm definitely not like you. How do you know? You haven't even bothered to get to know any of them. Listen, I get it. You've had it rough. Hey, Nate. It's Nathan. Nathan. Sorry. Um, it's not much, but if you want, um, you could stay at my place until you figure things out. We got a couch in the basement. If that doesn't work, um, I think some of the other guys are checking with their parents, too. Nathan went into this youth group thinking, I'm different than all of these other guys. I'm homeless. You look at him, he's covered with tattoos. None of those other kids had tattoos in there. His clothes are torn and ragged. He's living on the streets. And then he begins to share his story. And they all just sit there. And he's thinking, okay, so what did I just do? I shouldn't have been here. Look at how they were treating me. But then all of a sudden, somebody that he didn't even know comes up and says, hey, we've got a couch in my house. You want to come stay, with my, stay in my house? You can sleep there until, and if that doesn't work out, some of the other kids are checking with their parents. He didn't expect them to do that. He thought that they would just discard him like everybody else had. And what was he to do? But he found out that the people in the group didn't discard him. They treated him with respect and with kindness. They began to understand that They were doing something that God, ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand that God is very interested in how we treat 
outsiders. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 9, I've got all the scriptures on the, on the board. He goes like this. You must not oppress a foreign resident. You yourselves know how it feels to be a foreigner because you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. He was talking to the Israelites and saying, listen, do you understand something? May I say something to you? God has always been, always, always, always been the champion for the underdog. He's out there looking out for those that everybody else doesn't want to have anything to do with. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34 says, You must regard the foreigner who lives with you as a native born among you. You are to love him as yourself, for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. And I know that we've got a lot of foreigners in our country. And there's a lot of people that are dressed different than the way we dress. And there are some times that we don't like what they do. For instance, and I think you've heard the comment, when Hillary Clinton said that 50% of all of Donald Trump's supporters can all be put into a basket of deplorables. They are racist, sexist, xenophobic, um, bigots, and anything else that they could think of. There are people in our country that are racist. There are people in our country that are bigots. There are some people in our churches that are racist. There are some people in our churches that call themselves Christians who are bigots and xenophobic and homophobic and all kinds of phobics. But God tells us that we all were once foreigners. We all were once outcasts. And so are they. The problem is that we sometimes will talk about it is that we have not learned how to separate the sin from the individual. Because we're not them. We've never been them. We don't know what it's like to be them. Throughout the, the whole scriptures, he's talking about the foreigners, the parentless, the homeless, the hungry, the prisoners, the widows. Next scripture is Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 18. He executes judgment or justice for the fatherless and the widow. He loves the foreign residents, giving him food and clothing. God will take care of the needs. And he does it in many different ways. So if you got your Bibles this morning, let's turn to Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 through 40. He says, then the king will say to those on the right, come you who are blessed by my father or blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom, he said, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus said, listen, I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You took care of me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, 
when did we do these things? I don't ever remember coming to you when you were sick and visiting you. Lord, I've never seen you sick. I don't ever remember you being hungry and me giving you food. I always remember me being hungry and you feeding me. And, and Lord, I, I don't ever remember you going to jail yet. So how can I come visit you in jail? And he says, listen, Lord, when did we see you hungry, feed you, thirsty, and give you something to drink? Here's what he said. When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? Lord, we've never seen this of you. When did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? We have no clue what you're talking about. And look at what he said. And the king will answer them. I assure you that whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. You see, because you have to understand one of the greatest outcasts was Jesus. He didn't fit in. They didn't like him. He went against the grain. He was not the one that you wanted to stand up in the temple and offer him a seat to teach. Because he definitely was not going to teach what you think and what you believe if you were one of the religious leaders. He was doing a lot of things, and Jesus says here, listen, do you not understand that I am challenging you as a Christian that our Christianity and our relationship with God is best acted out when we offer God's love to the least of these? We can say we love God a whole lot to those people who are kind of like us in church, but what about those people who aren't like us? So let's give you a couple of illustrations this morning about some that were called outcasts. And let's see what Jesus did to them. First one is found in, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Now Jesus had gone up to the mountain to pray. As soon as he comes back down, he is hit and hit hard. He said when Jesus came down from the mountainside, a large crowd followed him. They were bigger than a Trump rally or bigger than a Hillary rally. Jesus, when he went, man, he had some big rallies. There were, there were no stadiums containing these people. They were all outside. And it said right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. His skin disease was leprosy. Reaching out his hand, the leper did. Or Jesus, he touched him and he said, I am willing to be made clean. Immediately his disease, he said, was healed. Look at verse number four. Then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anybody, just go. And show yourself to the priest and offer up the gift that Moses prescribed as a testimony to them. Now, Scripture records a lot of times where Jesus healed the, healed the sick, he healed the blind, but this healing was totally different than the healing of the blind and healing of the sick. You see, because this guy was a leper. Now, you could have been blind and you were not considered an outcast. You could have been sick and you were not considered an outcast. But if you were a leper, you were an outcast. 
You were not allowed to live in the city. You had to live outside the walls of the city, which meant you got no protection from the army. If anybody came to attack that city, you're not getting in. You're on your own outside the gates because leprosy was a very, a, a very contagious disease. You could get it just from um, basically, uh, what do I want to say? Drainage. And you have to understand it could come from droplets from the mouth, the nose, or someone who was infected. And just coming in contact with those fluids could cause you to get the disease. It attacked the skin. It broke out. It also attacked your peripheral nerves. So therefore, what ended up happening was you lost all feeling. You could injure yourself and not know how bad you injured yourself. And many of the people lost limbs because they didn't know that they had hurt themselves. And so it ended up with the hurt, just the oozing. They lost legs, arms, fingers, feet. But one of the worst effects was not the physical effect, but the social effect. You see, because they weren't allowed to come into the temple. They weren't allowed to worship. If they were a leper and we were Jewish, a leper would not come into the doors. They were not allowed. They couldn't come in and sing the songs and worship. They couldn't even go to the priest and give the offering that they were told to offer up, to give to the priest, to offer it up for them for God. They weren't allowed in. They had to stay outside. They were actually quarantined from the whole rest of the population. Because you see, they viewed leprosy as a representative of sin. And if you had leprosy, then evidently you were a sinner. Because why else would God afflict you with that and, and therefore not allow you to come in to hear the word of God or to be able to offer up the sacrifices? And if you couldn't open up the sacrifices, then you were a sinner. And that's the way their whole life was. It's kind of like the same way today. Um, wasn't too long ago. It's been in my lifetime that there were some churches that if I came in like this and I told them that I was a preacher, I was not allowed to preach. Number one, if you're going to get up in the pool pit, you must have a suit and a tie on. Okay. Number two, you can't wear socks like this. <laughs> they got to be one color. Okay? And you do not wear brown socks with a black um, suit. Number three, you. <laughs> yeah, my, my hair had to be. Well, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Women had to have long hair. It was a disgrace for women to have short hair. Women, women were not to cut their hair. Because do you, not, do you not know that a woman's hair is her glory? Number four, women could not wear jewelry except for basically a bracelets, glasses, and a wedding band. You are not to come decked in here with 28 rings, on your hands and on your toes. If you were a man like me or a preacher, I could not get up in the pulpit and preach because I'm not clean shaven. Clean shaven says you can only have a mustache. You cannot have any other facial hair on, on you. 
And you say, well, that was before. Ladies and gentlemen, there are churches today that still go by those rules. If you come in with tattoos, you better cover them up. If you don't, they've got something to, that you can put on as you walk in the door. And your greeters, <laughs> welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Oh, let me get you something to wear. <laughs> May I say to you that not all of these people are holy rollers. Some of these are Baptist. I know. <laughs> but it's the same thing today. And, and let me say this. If there was a person who was a biker, and in their prior life, they loved ink. Now, I, I do too. I write with it. And I would write things on my hand to remember, like phone numbers and stuff, right? I wasn't... Number, number, the other thing is, there ain't no way somebody's going to stick me with a needle. I have a hard enough time going to the hospital and getting stuck with those suckers. But let's say they did. And they get saved. What do you want them to do, a skin graft? Well, no, I, 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 I want them to get saved, but I just don't want them to show up in church. Duh. Then where do you want them to go? Well, they can worship outside. Uh, they've got biker churches, and they've got this, and they've got that. They don't want to go to a biker church. Maybe they want to come here or go there. And, and how do we look at it? And, and, and how do we see these things? Be, because you got to think about how revolutionary it was for this leper to go to Jesus. He was not allowed around people. And here's Jesus, and here's this leper, and he's coming into the presence of Jesus. And not just Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. He is coming into the presence of the crowd that is following Jesus. And they're all looking at him, and they're thinking, Holy moly, what's this dude doing coming here? We're all going to get leprosy and we're all going to have to go out of town. To me, I visualize it as the leprosy, the, the, the leper was like Moses parting the Red Sea. I guarantee you that when they saw the leper coming, man, they all started going every which direction. I do not want to get in any close proximity to him at all. And then all of a sudden, he comes up to Jesus and everybody's looking and saying, what's he going to do? How's he going to react? And they're looking to see what Jesus was going to do. And probably when Jesus takes his hand and reaches out and touches the leper, they're all probably saying, oh, no way! There goes our meal for tonight. Because I'm not going to eat any fish or bread that he's touching. I'll get the leprosy that he's getting from this guy. And then all of a sudden, Jesus touches the man. And, he, and he when he touches him, he's healed. And they're all sitting there taken back. What in the world happened to him? Well, let me say this to y'all. The moment that Jesus touches you, don't you change? You may have been a social outcast, but Jesus is saying, no, not anymore. <laughs> I'll take you in. I'll touch you. I'll make you whole. And when the great thing about it was, look at what he told the guy. He says, listen, don't you tell anybody what I just did. Now, I don't know about y'all. He's not going out and telling anybody what, it, what just happened to him. But I guarantee you all these people that saw it did. <laughs> but what did he tell him? He says, hey, go get the sacrifice that Moses has commanded you to give. And you go right into the temple. And you give it to the priest and have him offer it up for you. I don't know about y'all, but I guarantee you there was some commotion going on in that temple that day when they saw that man walk in there. 
Wasn't that the guy we saw out of town coming in here that kept hollering at us, unclean, unclean, and we had to keep going to the other side. He had to stay on the other side of the road. And how dare him? He's coming in here, but there's something wrong with him. He's not open sword anymore. He don't have leprosy anymore. He's coming in here and he's clean. Do you think he was received by all of the people in that temple? I don't. I think there were still some people in there that probably was still hesitating and saying, I'm not so sure about this. Uh, let's wait for a while. Let's find out when he's coming to services so I won't have to be there to serve at the same time. That was number one. Remember when Jesus went to a little place called Samaria? In Samaria, you have to understand, the Samaritans were considered by the Jews to be half-breeds. And the reason was, was because centuries earlier, the Jewish people had been attacked by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians conquered the Jews, they took a large population of, of their people into captivity, but they left some of the others behind. Well, the, what ended up happening was these Jews went on to start marrying people in the group that they were taken into. So now they're half Jewish and they're half, they're half something else. They were, they were considered, as Samaritans, outcasts. They were, they were not like us. So here it's Jesus going through Samaria and he happens to end up at a well at noon. Now, the thing about it is nobody went to the well at noon. Everybody went early in the morning, late at night, or in the cool of the evening to get the water. Because water carrying was heavy. And when it's hot out, you don't want to carry this, this water. It's like yesterday playing volleyball when the sun's out and it's humid and you're just sitting there drenched, not smart, okay? But we did it anyway, okay? But Jesus comes here. Now, so what happens? He ends up there and there's a woman that showed up, a sinner, an outcast. She was not only a woman, but she was a woman of loose morals. Okay? Now, you say, well, what do you mean? Well, let me just share with you some things. She was a social outcast. In the early age that I was, and some of you are, some, are my age, there was uh, uh, some children who were born out of a marriage of two different people. One was black and one was white. And that child was an interracial child. And that child, a lot of times in school, was a social outcast. They were just thrown aside. But if a soldier, let's say that soldier got stationed in um, Japan and he married a Japanese woman and they had children. They were not ostracized. They were not an outcast. Skin color was still light and everything was fine. There were a lot of churches that you could not go into that church if, if you had married outside of your race. grew up, my mom and dad had those beliefs. That's what they were taught. But in the days that my mom and dad grew up, they had um, what was called census. And what they did back then was they came around, knocked on your door, and they would ask how many people are living in your house? And they would start naming them from the top to the bottom by age. And then on there, they would put down their race. Their race was either 
white, black. And if they couldn't determine what it was, it was an M for mulatto, which says they're not white, they're not black, they're mixed. They could have been mixed by Heinz 57 because my, um, my grandmother was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian. And if you look at some of my uncles, if they were living, you would have seen the Indian in them. I didn't get any of that. But some of my brothers did. And so they would be shoved aside. In our day today, let me ask you this. If a lady walked in here and you knew by her dress and you knew the way she looked that she was a prostitute, what would you do? Hmm? Pray for her, hug her. But would we all? Or would we start casting judgment based upon them? What happens if somebody comes in here that's filthy dirty? Or what happens if somebody walks in the door and they're covered with bed bugs? Oh my God, no way. They didn't ask for them. It's an epidemic all over. Sometimes, yes, it's y'all scratching now, I know. So what ended up happening was the elite here, they, they were more concerned about how Jesus was spending time with this leper than he was healing of the leper. Let me give you another one. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 9. Tax collectors were considered the social outcasts of there. They were agents of the Roman government, and they had the reputation of being dishonest. So one day Jesus saw this tax collector called Matthew sitting at his tax collection post, and here's what he said. As Jesus went on there, he saw Matthew, a, a man by the name of Matthew sitting at his tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So what did he do? He got up and he followed him. Jesus did not see Matthew as an outsider. He did not see him as a social outcast. He saw him as a human being that needed love, needed somebody with compassion to bring him to the Father. And oh, he did. What did he do? He, he went home that night and threw one of the biggest parties ever known in that city. And lo and behold, Jesus showed up. And he was sitting with a bunch of social outcast sinners. And the church people came up and they looked inside and they said, what's all that commotion? They're all partying in there. Can't you tell? Well, let me ask you this question. When was the last time that anybody came up to the doors of this church and peeked inside and said, man, they're having a party in there? You ever think about that? Or sometimes when we get singing some songs and y'all get rowdy and you're going, woo! <laughs> Praise the Lord. Raise your hands if you can. I understand, man, sometimes they're sore and you can't do it, okay? You get them up like this, you, you know, or whatever. And somebody walks in and they see this going on and they turn right around and walk out. They say, look, I think I got to check the sign out again. It says Calvary Baptist Church. Is that right? Is the Baptist Church doing this stuff? Hold on a minute. We, we need to ask them, is this really the right church or has someone taken over this building? Because sometimes we're considered the, out, the outcasts that are there. Okay, so he threw this big party and invited all of his friends and Jesus broke bread with them. Now, Jesus was invited to supper one day at a home 
of a Pharisee named Simon. And when he arrived, he was not offered the traditional welcomes, okay, that a guest would receive. When Jesus walked into the house of Simon, he, was, he did not get his, foots, his feet washed. He did not get a kiss like they would generally do when somebody would come into there. Okay? And, and so what, it, what ends up happening was he also did not get the anointing of the oil on his head. And this is what would happen if you traditionally came into a Jewish home. They would wash your feet. They would greet you with a kiss. And then they would anoint you with oil on your head. Jesus didn't get that, okay? Now they're sitting down to eat. And there's a local prostitute that came into the house looking for Jesus. She didn't get her feet washed. She didn't get a kiss from nobody. Maybe she did. But not a, a holy kiss. And she didn't get anointed. And she's walking through here. Jesus is sitting down. And all of these people know her. And they see her coming in all of a sudden. What's he going to do? How's he going to react? Here's our next verses. Out of Luke chapter 7, verses 44 to 47. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who's forgiven little loves little. Do you hear what he said to Simon? Let me repeat. Did you see this woman? Have you seen her yet, Simon? Did you notice what she did? You see, because Simon only saw a prostitute, Jesus saw someone's life going to be changed. They only saw what she used to do. Jesus saw what she was going to become. Jesus... Jesus saw what she, what they were supposed to be doing, but she did. And he says, now look here. She loves me a whole lot because according to you, she's got more sins. But according to you, you've only got a little sin, so you only love me a little. He says, the one that's got the more sins loves me more. And he begins to start talking about these. You see, we're to care for outcasts, whether they're physical, emotional, and all of those. But let me give you a, a story. There's a guy by the name of Tony, uh, of Tony Campoli. Now, he's a minister and an author. And he tells a story about this lady who who's, was ignored by most people. But when he saw her, he saw her not as, as ignored, but he saw her as an individual. Early one morning, he was sitting in this 24-hour cafe. And he was drinking coffee at the counter. And there was a group of prostitutes that walked in to this cafe where he was at. 
and they took up the stools around him. So here he is, a minister, sitting at a, at a, at a counter, drinking his coffee, surrounded by a group of prostitutes. So, what happened was, there was one of the girls, her name was Agnes. And she was talking, and he was over her conversation that tomorrow was going to be her birthday. And she has never had anybody give her a birthday cake. So, Tony talked to the cafe owner, and he says, do you know these people? And he says, oh, yeah. This is the same group of women come in here every night, same time. They come in here, they get their coffee, and then they'll go right back out onto the streets. So he said, okay. He says, here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, we're going to hold a surprise. When she comes in, we're going to give her a surprise birthday cake at a birthday party. Word somehow got out onto the street what they were going to do. So that, that night, not just that group of prostitutes showed up. That cafe was filled with all of the prostitutes in the whole area, all in one place. Agnes walks in. And when she walks in, they all broke out singing, happy birthday to you. And then they presented her with her birthday cake. She broke down in tears crying. She says, can I take a picture of this and go show my mom that somebody gave me a birthday cake? That somebody loved me enough to do that? She walks out of there let me tell you the rest of the story. The cafe owner was not a Christian. And he asked Tony, he says, why did you do that? He says, that's what we're supposed to do. He says, no, <laughs> I've been around Christians and that's not the way Christians act. He says, what church are you the pastor of? And he told him. He sat down that night and led that cafe owner to the Lord by a birthday cake. It wasn't a track. It wasn't a Bible beating him over the head with scriptures. It was showing the love of God to somebody. And it had so much impact that he wanted to know why in the world would you do that? She's a prostitute. And he says, no, she's a human being loved by God, no matter who she is. And he says, that's what we need. And ladies and gentlemen, this is what we need to understand what this church is all about. This church is a community. And God's community is awesome. When people are broken, they're coming here and they need to be mended. They don't need to be felt more broken. There are people that are hurting. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. He loved us that much. Our church can be different. It can be honest. Or ladies and gentlemen, we can be hypocrites. I got a picture. Hopefully it'll show on the screen. You got it, Mark? It's a little boy. Fourth grade. His teacher asked him to fill out something. Some fascinating facts about you today. He says, I'm 11 years old. I'm in the fifth grade. My teacher's name is Miss Feld. It's hard for me to read all of this. The members of my family are, and he, he lists all of those. Some of my friends are. No one. No one. My favorite food is pizza. Why not? 
My favorite sport is soccer. Uh, my favorite TV show is something I can't read down. What is it? Elmo? Okay, good. All right. My, my favorite song is something. My favorite school activity is, and when I grow up, I want to be a teacher. They uh, sent this home. The teacher did to all of the parents. Here's what the parents, here's what the father wrote and published. For those of you who do not know, my youngest son, Christopher, is on the autistic spectrum. I went to his back to school night on Thursday and took a picture of one of his projects displayed on the wall. One of many cute little cards that all the kids in class had filled out and asked him how to list his favorite, um, and asked him to list his favorite food, sports, TV shows, and etc. I took the picture hurriedly and didn't notice all the answers he had filled out at the time. It was only after I got home that something stood out upon closer review. So do you guys remember a couple weeks ago the massive amount of press time that the Florida State football player got when he sat down at the lunch table with an autistic boy that was eating alone? And if you haven't seen it yet, those two have become very good friends. That player didn't know the boy was, an, was on the autistic spectrum when he sat down with him. He just sat, saw the boy eating lunch all by himself and decided to join him. A teacher snapped a picture of the moment and it went viral. That's what made the story great. It wasn't staged. It was just a great moment of human kindness. The follow-up to that story was that the boy no longer ate alone. The other kids now were sitting with him and patting him on the back. The boy now had friends. Me and every, everything was right with the world. Something that wasn't right was fixed and tied up neatly with a pretty little bow of kindness and understanding. But here's what the father wrote. But in my head I asked, where were those kids prior to this child being thrust into the spotlight? We know they were there. They're in the picture sitting at other tables ignoring him. If that football player had not sat down next to that child, if it hadn't become a national news story, that kid would still be sitting by himself today. It is not their fault. That's the saddest part. They were clearly not taught to embrace and accept the differences of others. Not by their teachers, which would have been nice had they thought to do so, but by their parents. I don't mean to imply that parents that don't have this conversation with their kids are bad people but only that somewhere in between working, soccer practice, homework, it, I typically, or, I'm sorry, it never occurred to them to have this particular conversation. I'm sure that if Christopher were typical, that's the word we use instead of normal in, in our world of Holland for our developmentally delayed children. I would have not have had this conversation with him either. Christopher's brothers have had many, many sleepovers over the year, obviously in front of him. It's not going unnoticed. Can I have a sleepover, Christopher is asked. Sure, buddy, with whom? As a response, he would flap his arms and stem, and stem instead of answering. He didn't have an answer because he didn't have a name, because he didn't have a friend. He's never had a friend, ever. He just turned 11. And because he's had no friends, there was no one to invite. I don't have a solution. I don't have an answer. The reality is that I have to rely on the compassion of others to be incredibly understanding in order just to sit next to him, attempt to engage him, and make him feel included. My son's very smart, great sense of humor. Every adult that meets him is drawn to him. However, because he needs the input, he will spontaneously flap his arms and make loud guttural sounds from time to time. It draws a lot of attention in public. If you're not used to it, it's normal to feel embarrassed as you will have all the eyes in the room upon you. He'll ask the same question 50 times in a short period of time. His latest is, what time do you go to bed? And what's your address? 
I typically have to tell the servers in restaurants just to give him the restaurant's address, as once he has a satisfactory answer, he'll, he will usually move on. Like I said, there's no easy answer for this. At the end of the day, it comes down to compassion, empathy, and understanding, but mostly empathy. Not from you guys, but from your children. As far as I know, say for one time, Christer's classmates have never been cru overly cruel to him. What they've done, however, is to exclude him. And frankly, I understand this. His classmates are delayed as well, but most not as much as Christopher. They're figuring out how to interact socially every day. And because Christopher cannot engage them in a typical way, he gets left behind, excluded until Thursday. I didn't know how aware he was of this divide as he does not often talk about his peers. I should not have been surprised as he makes his wants, but not his emotional needs very clear. But I was. Mostly, I suppose, because I've never seen him put I've never seen him put it down on paper. For the first time, it's staring me in the face. I guess I'm sharing this because when he asked to list his friends, he wrote never no one. Never have five letters cut so deep. And they weren't even directed at me. It was just an overly simplistic statement that spoke volumes. And because I know him so well, and because I have a pretty good handle on him after raising him for 11 years, I know this disconnect makes me feel lonely. And it makes me feel sad. Usually, I have to figure out what Christopher is trying to say. As his manner of speaking is very straightforward, very black and white. This time I did not. It's clear to me that he desperately wants to be part of the group. But his challenges make it difficult for his peers to include him. The only solution that I can come up with is to share this with you and ask that you have a conversation with your kids. Please tell them that children with special needs understand far more than we give them credit for. They notice when others exclude them. They notice when they are teased behind their back. A lot of times behind their back is right in front of them because they think the different child doesn't understand. But mostly they are very much in tune when they're treated differently from everyone else. Trust me when I tell you this hurts them, even if it's not obvious to you and me. For the first time ever, I'm going to ask you for favor here on Facebook. One, share this post on your timeline. Awareness and empathy are the only solutions I can come up with. Two, speak with your children. Show them the video of the Florida State football player. The internet is full of feel-good stories about a special needs child being included. Remember the special needs child that was put in the basketball game for the last few few minutes of the final game of the season. Very recently, there was a prom king who gave a crown to a special needs classmate. These stories are noobs worthy because they're unusual. We're not used to hearing about kids being kind to those that are different and unique. I'm not so naive that I think this post is going to change the world. But if by sharing this, I can make you think about having a conversation with your children about empathy, about going out of their way to include those that are different from everybody else, especially if it goes against the group, group mentality, especially if it's not socially popular. I'm not so old that I don't remember that this takes bravery. Bravery is a break from the, uh, the confines of what your friends think is cool in the middle and high school worlds. Then I will feel like Chris's voice has been heard. Because even though he can't say it, he wants to be included. He wants a voice that at the moment he doesn't have, and he needs to find his voice. And the child that will finally reach out to him, that will help him, that will include him, will be the kindest child, the child that does the right thing by going above and beyond. He will be Charlie Bucket, and that child will be Christopher's first true friend. Thanks for listening. Sincerely, Christopher's dad. And here's his update. As I have just learned that this has gone viral. All of the requests that I'm receiving to write Christopher a letter or send a care pack package now makes sense. This was an idea that was started by KMBZ radio personalities, Dana and Scott, or one of their listeners as precise, uh, to be precise. So this card shower is on its way. Many of you have asked to send cards and packages to Christopher, so please join in the party. I will be posting his reactions online. You may write to him at Christopher Cornelius, 96 Valley View Drive, Rockway, New Jersey, 7866. Missed a number there. Thank you for your grace and your kindness. It is very much appreciated. That's a father talking about his child. 
That's God talking about his children to the church. It can be the same way, just placed a different way. Because sometimes people are different and they need friends. We need to be teaching people empathy. Feeling their pain and their hurt. Because ladies and gentlemen, we are not alike. And as most of you all know, I am as strange as strange can be. And I thank you for taking me in and being my friend. And if you can take in someone as weird as me, you've got some other people around here that ain't that quite strange. That's why I thank you for yesterday, your time of sitting there and not just eating and leaving. Of getting to know one another and talking to one another and sharing stories with one another and understanding that people in this congregation are hurting and they need people to feel their pain. It isn't that you can take the pain away, but it's what you can share with them. Because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to share with one another. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can't share with one another, you need to find another church. Because we're getting people in here that are hurting. I ran into a lady Thursday that's looking for a place to go. Who just lost her daughter 26 years of age, three years ago. And she's still hurting. Because the night before she had told her mom, I'm clean. I've given up the heroin. I'm changing my life. And the next morning she got a call that they found her. She had OD'd. There are too many parents that are losing their children. And they're looking for somebody to help them. They're looking for somebody to share. And guys, we've got to be that someone. Because what everybody else is seeing is heroin addicts. That's just going to steal everything from you. And cheat you and lie to you. And everything else. But what God sees is a child that needs direction. You may not be a heroin addict, but you may be the biggest liar in this church. And nobody knows it. You see, we all got issues. We all got problems. And if you don't have any, I'll give you some of mine. You can take them. But the question is, what are we going to become as a church? How do we, what are we going to be known as? Good music? Fair preaching? Teaching? Are we going to be known by a church that loves people? No matter who they are. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have, on Sunday evening, during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night 
We have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you. Great.